Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and place, this opportunity, this, this space that we have here to worship you. And we ask now that you would send your Holy Spirit on us to fill us with faith, to fill us with, with faith in Jesus Christ, to, to strengthen us and open our hearts so that we may hear your words of love and life and forgiveness. Be with us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, throughout this Lenten season, we have been kind of on this food theme. We've talked about uh, fast food and clean food and good food and lasting food and heavenly food. And today we're going to bring that, that series to an end with holy food. And I think, uh, as we, which makes sense, because as uh, on this Monday Thursday, as we as we recognize this holy meal that we are going to take part in, we need to understand a little bit about what it's all about. Now, to understand holy food, I think first of all we have to understand what holy means. And and I know that I've talked about this before, but can somebody tell me? What holy means. See, it's good to review every now and then. That's okay. Holy means to be set apart for something special. Holy is, is different. Holy is other than... So when, when God talks about us being holy, we are to be different than the world around us. We are to be set apart as something special. God is holy. God is different. God is very different. He's beyond what we can possibly imagine. God also makes things holy. In Genesis chapter 2, so God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God made the Sabbath day holy. It was something to be set apart. It was something to be special. Some, a time for you and me to spend some time with our Creator. Holy is also something that we need to honor and to some degree be afraid of, to fear. Let's take a look at Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Moses had to take his sandals off because it was holy ground. If he hadn't, he would have been destroyed in the presence of God's holiness. God's presence created the holiness of that ground. Now I think to truly understand this concept of holiness, we ought to go back to a couple of weeks ago in the midweek uh, service, we talked about clean food. And we need to talk about clean and unclean and holy and unholy and common. And I first of all want to start off with holy and unholy. Now, holy and unholy, unholy doesn't necessarily mean evil. Unholy just means it's not set apart. It is simply common. So we have holy and we have unholy or common. And then underneath common, we have clean and unclean. And things that are, that are unclean can make something that is clean unclean. For instance, if you were to have a glass of water and you took a, a, a dropper of ink and you put just a single drop into that glass of water, it would make that entire glass unclean. And if you think that that's not necessarily unclean and that you would drink that glass of water, consider if it were a drop of urine. 
Would you drink that glass of water then? In the same way, a single sin on our part makes us completely unclean. We are unclean. And when we are unclean, the problem is that that an unclean thing in the presence of holiness is destroyed. And that's why we could never go to heaven if it weren't for the love of Christ. Because He takes our uncleanness away from us so that we can be in the presence of a holy God. Moses had to take off his sandals because of that holy ground. Just like you and I, so so many of us in our homes, we walk into our homes and the first thing we do is we take off our our shoes because they're There's dirt and there's dust and there's grime that comes in with us. They are not clean. In the same way, Moses had to take off his dirty sandals to be on that holy ground. But God is not only holy. God is technically the the definition of holy. But He is more than simply holy. In Isaiah chapter 6, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory." God is not only holy, He is holy, holy, holy. He is so far different from us. And like Moses, Isaiah hides his face and he says, I am ruined, I am a, a man of unclean lips. He knew that his uncleanness in the presence of a holy God would destroy him. Uncleanness cannot enter the presence of holiness. And that brings us to today for this this celebration of the Lord's Supper because when Jesus celebrated the Passover, it was an important day. In Exodus chapter 12, God says to Moses, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever, for you shall keep it as a feast. The Passover was a memorial day or a holy day or that's where we get our word for holiday. It was a day that was set apart to be remembered. And so Jesus would have certainly made sure that this day was important in his life, especially in the last hours of his life here on earth. In Matthew 26 from our gospel reading, He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. But what is this holy day that the the disciples and Jesus are celebrating, this Passover? What is it all about? To remember that, we need to go back to our first reading again from Exodus 12. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. They put the blood on the doorpost and on the lentil so that, so that the angel of death, God himself, the Spirit of God, when he entered that time, that area, that the children of Israel would not be destroyed, but that the firstborn of the Egyptians would die. That tenth plague that sealed the deal for Pharaoh so that the children of Israel could leave Egypt, leave the bonds of slavery. And on that Passover night that Jesus and his disciples were were celebrating, Jesus 
understood that, but he also put a bit of a twist for the disciples, a new understanding of the Passover. Back to our gospel in Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This holy meal was set aside. Jesus himself, Christ himself, was supplying the very body and blood. His body and blood was supplying the bread and the wine for them to eat and to drink. It was a holy meal. It was Jesus' body and blood that within hours he would be hung on a cross, sacrificed for them, giving them not only his body and blood in this Lord's Supper, but sacrificing himself for them. Holy and unclean cannot, cannot come together, but holy and clean can. Jesus washed the disciples' feet that night and said, you are clean. And he ate, they, they ate of this incredible holy meal of Jesus' body and blood. Now, holiness can also, as, as we have unclean things make clean things unclean, clean things do not make holy common or unholy. In fact, it's the opposite of that. Holy things make clean things holy. Let's take a look at Exodus chapter 30. And you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tent of meeting and the ark of testimony and the table and all its utensils and the lampstand and the utensils and the altar of incense and the altar of burnt offerings with all its utensils and the basin and its stand. You shall consecrate them and that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them will become holy. Holy. Holy things make clean things holy. When they are consecrated, clean things become holy. And in this, in this incredible holy meal that we have of Jesus' body and blood, when they, as they are consecrated, they become holy and they reach out to us with holiness. The forgiveness that we experience from Jesus' death and resurrection makes us clean. God's holiness not only makes us clean, it makes us holy, set apart, different from the world. In Colossians 1, Paul writes, And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus' death and resurrection, his death on the cross makes us clean. His sacrifice wipes away our sin and we can be presented before God the Father, our creator, as holy and blameless like walking on the sun, able to be in his presence without being destroyed. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. We are God's holy temple. As His church, we join together to be a holy representation for our God to the world. He has made us clean. He has made us holy. He has made us His holy temple for Him to dwell in and for us to share His holiness with the world. Again, Paul writes in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The church of Jesus Christ is holy, called to be different from the world, called to be set apart, cleansed and made holy for His work in the world. The church is called to be set apart because of Christ's death, His resurrection. We are clean. We are holy. We are made new. In Hebrews chapter 10, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, How incredible is that, that we are washed clean, that we are made holy, that through the blood of Christ we are clean for good. The work of God in us makes us clean, makes us holy. We are forgiven. And when we come in that clean, forgiven state to this altar to take part in the holy meal, We are given a shot of holiness once again. Forgiven once again. And made holy. Called for God's purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for the forgiveness we experience through Christ and his death on the cross. We thank you that through that forgiveness we have been made clean and through your holiness we are made holy. This evening as we take part in this holy meal of Jesus' very body and blood, we ask that you would clean us and make us holy, make us pure to be your holy temple in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.